So I want to get started um, with a very recent uh, article from The Hub. Fraser Institute, Canada's living standards are falling behind the rest of the developed world. This month, Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland pro proclaimed that Canada is the best country in the world. But it's a hard statement to square with the evidence. Canadians are getting poorer relative to their peers in many other countries, and our living standards are falling. This trend is expected to continue well into the future unless our policymakers make significant changes. Economists all often measure living standards by real gross domestic product, GDP, per person. In other words, the inflation-adjusted monetary value of what a country produces in goods and services divided by its population. Now, I have my own art. I have my own grievances with how we measure this, and I'll get into that sometime. I probably <laughs> agree with you. I was thinking, but it nonetheless is not a great indicator of how Canada is doing, and it it certainly uh, may contribute um, to essentially what's on the ground floor. Uh, okay. which is everybody and their dog that I know is just not having a good time. Well, it's really, if you're going to like judge standard of living, you should be looking at like wage versus cost of living. So the yeah. wage should be much lower than the cost of living or uh, much higher. Sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, we, and we're like this now for sure. Like it's completely kilted now. Where it's like even like people can't afford to rent houses. They have to have like four or five roommates. That kind of oh, stuff. Yeah. Right? Like it's I'll never forget um when I first moved in with my then girlfriend, now wife. Um there was an apartment, and these were fairly affordable apartments, at least for Toronto. So mm -hmm. still not affordable at all, but you know, yeah. not like not like the like 60% of my income is going towards rent sort of shit. Right. Um, so we had, we had a neighbor across, this, uh, across the hallway from us. They had six people. I'm not kidding. Six people living in a two bedroom, six people in a two bedroom. And I remember the, the neighbors complaining like, oh, they're drunk all the time. And I'm like, wouldn't you be? That that sounds weird. Yeah, like, well, yeah, like just the, like even if it's a family, that many people in that small of an area is hard. Yeah, for sure. You can't get any kind of privacy at any time, which people need. People need to have time where they can just decompress by themselves. Even for uh -huh. a few minutes. Oh, also, hello, future homestead. I just wanted to say hello before I forgot. Oh, hey, man. Happy Monday to you, too, my friend. So, yeah. <clears throat> There's definitely some criticisms with this measurement specifically. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't really apply because... It, it doesn't really uh, apply to what they're reporting on because realistically, like... A more fair to the working class measurement would probably just mirror this at this point. Um, you know, the cost of living skyrocketing, wages are stagnant as hell. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got a home ownership crisis. Uh, I I don't think even think it's a crisis anymore. I think it's just a reality that it's like you're you're not owning a home. That's it. Sorry. Yeah. Well, and the stock market is about to collapse again. Probably worse yep. than in 2008. Like, it's gonna... And that's gonna be really bad, because then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we've got to bail out the billionaires again. We, we have yeah. nobody working to bail them out with. You know what's really interesting? In times like this, I notice the capitalism... Uh, capitalism is a great system. People are very quiet. I'm not... I just, you know, usually they're pretty cocky. Mm -hmm. But when something like this happens, I notice they're very quiet. Yeah. And I think that's because the, that evil socialism rears its head to 
to bail out to bail out the billionaires. <clears throat> and yeah. a lot of people argue like a lot of a lot of anarcho capitalism types, also known as my uh, mortal enemies, if you will. <laughs> They'll argue, well, that's the problem. Um, if there were like competition and we didn't bail these companies out, then it would be a better system. And I'm like, no, it would just collapse. You don't yeah. understand. We'd have empty buildings everywhere. Like, like I, I use the Rogers example nowadays. I'm like, you don't understand how this works, okay? If we just let this stuff collapse, like there would be a domino effect on a level that you would not be able to comprehend. Mm -hmm. Like we just need to take the companies from these people is what they need to do, but also not have them run by a current government. So it's a bit tricky there. Yeah, well, we need a lot of industries that need to be nationalized, but we also need a government that is like not going to mess up the bag. And I don't trust yeah. neoliberal. I don't trust neoliberals in government. I don't trust conservatives in government either. Frankly, I don't trust no. a lot of orgs in government because they always end up working for the same for the wrong type of people. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <clears throat> As noted in a new study published by the Fraser Institute from uh, 2002 to 2014, Canada's GDP per person growth uh, roughly kept pace with the rest of the OECD. But from 2014 to 2022, the latest year of available comparable data, Canada's average growth rate declined uh, sharply, ranking third lowest among 30 countries over the period. Consequently, in dollar terms, Canada's GDP per person increased only $1,325 during this time period, compared to the OECD average increase of $5,070, all values in uh, 2015 U.S. dollars. So, <clears throat> just like, look, look at this. Just like, look at this chart. Ooh. 0 0.06. Look at us go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're not, uh, we're pretty down bad. Um, <coughs> yeah. We're very down bad. That's just, I don't, yeah, it's pretty, pretty depressing. Um, <clears throat> moreover, between 2014 and 2022, Canada's GDP per person declined from 80.4% of the U.S. level to 72.3%. We lost substantial ground to key allies and trading partners like the United Kingdom, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. According to OECD projections, Canada will have the lowest projected an average annual growth rate of GDP per person at 0.78%. From 2030 to 2060, man, that 2030 number keeps popping up. Not sure why. All the time. <laughs> That's when our GDP per person is <laughs> the OECD average by 8,617. <laughs> swing of more than $11,000 from where it was in 2002. <clears throat> why is this happening? So that's this is the part where it gets a little up for debate because. A lot of people are going to fill in the blanks. There are several factors oh. that have contributed to this. They include historically weak business investment over the past decade, a substantial shift in the composition of permanent and temporary ignorance, uh, immigrants, sorry, towards those with less education and fewer skills, and subdued technological innovation and adoption. These factors have combined to produce very low or negative labor productivity growth, due to weak growth in the education and skills of the average worker and the amount of capital, namely plant, machinery, and equipment per worker. While most advanced countries are experiencing similar trends, the situation in Canada is among the worst. Consequently, our relative decline in living standards will grow exponentially because Canada's poor, uh, poor performance will compound over time. <clears throat> and then we have the how do we change it to break out of this rut and pre prevent this uh, further decline in Canada's living standards relative to our peers? 
Policymakers must enact comprehensive and bold policy changes to encourage a business uh, investment in innovation, promote worker education and training, and achieve better immigration outcomes. More is not always better. <clears throat> okay, so this is this is where I start to deviate a little bit because I understand um, I understand why Western countries like immigration so much. And it's because the billionaires usually can pay them a lot less. They can get a, a lot cheaper labor for their return. And they, still and they get don't labor. have to invest in the education. Someone else does. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They basically just get fresh bodies that they, they can throw at, a, throw at a lumber mill. Yeah. Um, and they, on average, pay, uh, are able to pay them less money. That's why they like them. Uh, well, I know years ago they started letting restaurants bring in um, uh, help from overseas, and they would pay. I don't know how, like, I don't know if they were paid the exact same, but basically they were on working contracts, so they had them by the balls. Like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Like you, you had their lives in their hand, whether you were paying them fairly or not. Yeah, and they'd get deported <clears throat> if they do anything wrong. Well, exactly. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that's part of the problem. Um, mm -hmm. To clarify, I'm absolutely, I, there's a, a tiny bit of a bend in this article where it's like uh, immigration. The immigration is not the problem. The problem is the, the problem here is how the system we live under uh, treats immigration. Like 90% of these problems can be solved by just simply not exploiting your workforce. Yeah. But I digress. Well, it takes skilled labor from those other countries where they need it more than we do. We have the money and the technology to train our own citizens. We don't need to steal citizens from other countries. Like, let them help build their own country for themselves. <laughs> Make it viable to do that. I mean, unless they want to come here, then that's different, right? I just mean, like, well, the thing, don't be, like, <clears throat> luring them here with candy and a white van, CIA. <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, so traditionally what corporations do is they just get the labor overseas. If it's any kind of work from home or remote situation, they just get the labor yeah. overseas, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you can't uh, operate a factory from home. You have yeah. to physically bring people in. The additional problem with getting labor overseas is essentially those people are just keeping that money. So you're getting labor and you're, you're acquiring labor. You're acquiring the surplus value of the labor. Um, but you're not getting their purchasing power. If mm -hmm. these people are overseas, they're going to spend that money overseas. Mm -hmm. um, even if it is the tiny exploitative wages. Yep. So essentially you are reducing the purchasing power of the same group of people that you have to also employ. This is one of the primary contradictions of capitalism. It's, uh, it's, it's in my opinion, one of the greatest points that Karl Marx ever friggin' made. Um, so they bring the people in. They have pretty much all the negotiating power. And these people are far more easily exploitable than a, you know, a normal Canadian who, you know, can basically say like, oh, no, 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 no. That's way too low. I'm worth yeah. 10K more than that. No. Yeah, or that's that actually against the rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's see, what else did they say here? As a starting point, government should improve the climate for business investment and for investment in education and training by streamlining reg regulation and major project approvals and reducing current and expected future tax burdens on businesses and workers. Okay, so just we need to give tax breaks to the... The, the, the investor poor. class. Yeah. Uh, it, like, listen, guys. This is exactly the solution part is exactly what you're going to expect it to be. I don't know what else. Oh, these, these banks failed. We need to give them more money. Aren't they mm. a bank? 
Like, <laughs> yeah. And then, <clears throat> and then the levels of government debt and debt interest costs are approaching thresholds of unsustainability not seen since uh, the 1990s. Uh, they must exercise spending restraint to put their finances on a more sustainable path. <clears throat> I would just like to say that this is, and we will get into this further in a future episode, but um, that's actually pretty friggin' hard to do under capitalism. Especially since, as we're seeing right now with the massive collapse, the government usually has to end up bailing out all these giant industries and corporations when the system finally craps the bed as it reliably does every five to seven years. <clears throat> well, you got to figure out how to keep that Ponzi scheme going. The stock market's not going to Ponzi away. It's out. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's how we're doing. Uh, cost of living wise. Um, and there's a bunch of other articles just giving you guys a baseline on how we're doing up here. We're not doing great. Um, and, you know, it's not it's not entirely dissimilar to what's going on in America or many other Western countries out there. Mm. But uh, we're getting hit the hardest, frankly. Um, well, I've um, I've uh, I met a guy from Croatia that lived in my old uh, condo building up in my old home. And one of the things we talked about, he's like, the cost of living here is insane. He's like, it's how, how, how do you guys manage? And like, he was working for the sites and stuff too. Like he was making good money, but he's like, it's so expensive. Everything. Well, our government's filled with landlords, literally. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, they're not, they're not doing anything about the problem. Um, you know, we, our minimum wage is better than say America, but it's still not, I mean, I, it's not even close at this point. You can't, it, it's, it's, not it's hard. To, it's hard to even rent something in minimum wage. If you're working minimum wage and don't forget guys, minimum wage used to mean the minimum amount of money you needed to make to like have a home, support a family under like one income, have children. That's what minimum wage meant. Now it doesn't mean anything. Minimum wage doesn't have a definition anymore. It just means the minimum amount of money that employers can pay you. That's it. It used to mean a lot more than that. It doesn't anymore. Mm -hmm. No, nope, because now it's, you're it's exactly what, correct. And there's nothing to measure it against either. Like, what are you measuring this by? How do you determine the minimum wage at this point? Because at this point, it just seems like vibes. Because like, it's not yeah, the minimum amount to. It's not the mi minimum amount to what pay your bills and and rent a flat. Because it's not going to yeah. cover that. Nope. Um, there's no like minimum wage. Just means like that's the minimum and that's it. Used to mean we can't pay you lower, but we would. <clears throat> anyway, that's yes, how we're doing. Uh, hmm? I was just saying yes to Max there in the chat. Oh, gosh. Gotcha. Comments. <clears throat> that is I'm correct. A person. Justin Trudeau is part of the WEF. He is. Um, he was a young global leader, like many of them, kind of like we mm -hmm. indicate in the title. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we are going to dedicate a whole episode to this, just to give you guys a roadmap. We are going to have an episode coming up where we cover all the major political players. Um, we're also going to have a full episode dedicated to nothing but the, uh, the involvement of the World Economic Forum in Canadian politics and influencing this country. This is something that I will never understand why the left stays away from. 
But for some reason, a lot of them panic and freak out the second you mention the WEF and like the conservative side is given free reign to talk about it all day, all night, going to like lizard people levels with it because they're weird. Um, And I've always found it weird because as, as someone who identifies as like at least, you know, class uh, aware, Mm -hmm. like the world economic forum, the people who meet at Davos, like these groups, these groups represent the largest, like concentration, like coalition of, of, of moneyed interests the world's ever seen. Like the left should be the, the left should be the people who primarily on this. Non-stop. Files just put out a great episode about this. Actually. Have you ever watched yeah. the Y Files? I have not. Oh yeah, it's pretty good. He he did a really good summation of like the Bilderberg Group today. It was pretty interesting. Nice. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, maybe we'll reference something from it. Yeah, all these all these giant groups like it's literally the Carlin quote. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. That's yep. That's it. Like. They go to a secret area that no one's, no journalists are allowed. It's heavily guarded by like black ops people. The no reporting on it whatsoever comes out of it. Politicians show up and then we know nothing about what happened. And then suddenly, like apparently the. Two months before the coronavirus happened, they were talking about it at the uh, Bilderberg Group, and then magically it showed up. Was it the- yeah, so that was, um, I think that was event event to something. I don't remember the exact name, but they did have a uh, they did have a simulation of uh, mm-hmm. what would happen if a global pandemic happened. It was like a quirky little game they played, which yeah. I took as like, "Are you guys kidding me?" And then a lot of the compatible left lost their minds over this. They're like, oh, my God, I can't believe you guys are being so conspiratorial, calling it the pandemic and everything. And it's like, well, can you blame people? There's a the they, plan there's is simulation. Down. <laughs> they're, they're talking about simulations and you can't you can't like possibly see how a group of people is already deeply mistrustful of their mm-hmm. elected officials and governing bodies for absolutely valid reasons would come to like be suspicious of this it's just it's blowing your mind yep that's the part well, I, don't I, remember get. For, I remember for years people would always talk like oh there's no shadow government of the states and i was like let's be honest that's the only thing that makes sense i was like you watch these idiots debate in like the white house or in the white house or the oval office or whatever they are they're this is about Canadian politics, by bad. Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. They have no idea what they're talking about half the time. I mean, I've always kind of argued it's like you don't. The, the shadow government is implying that there's there's an entity we don't know about. It's really simple. You can go find the shadow government right now. Go into any big city and look up at the tallest buildings in the city. That's your mm-hmm. shadow government, because that's who your politicians and our politicians work for. And there's yeah. nothing but evidence to support this. It's 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 very simple. In capitalist countries, the politicians work for the billionaire class first and the poor second. And they have two primary jobs. Catering to the needs of the billionaires, because we're all still in 2024. Depressingly enough, living under this weird illusion that all of this wealth one day, you know, finally one day it's just finally gonna, gonna yeah, it's just finally gonna trickle all the way down to the poor people. Just gonna go right there. And then their their secondary function, and this is this is a lot of what you see with the NDP up here. This is what a lot of what you see of the squad down there and the uh, you know, the the more progressive heavy quotes there american politicians pretty much there's a lot of larpers in the west in general <clears throat> but basically their second primary function is to keep the people out of the streets 
Not the altruistic way, as in, like, we should give these people housing because everybody deserves to have a roof over their heads. No, literally keep them out of the streets. Like, keep yeah. them from rioting. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Keep them from... Keep, it, keep them from installing Lenin.exe. That's, that's, their, that's their biggest role. And that's what you see from all this lip service from politicians. It's to serve the billionaires, create the illusion that you're actually... Someone in that government is actually fighting for you. Yeah. Surprise. Nobody is. We're, if, we want, if, if, if we want, as Canadians, a government that works for us, at this point, we're literally going to have to take it back. No, a lot of people don't like that reality. But mm-hmm. much like the states, I don't think we're voting our way out of this. Because look no. at... Hmm? Someone often referred to politics as the entertainment division of the military industrial complex. And I was like, that's the most accurate thing I've ever heard. Frank Zappa. That's my favorite. Yeah. yeah. It's the, the change. I'll put it this way. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again, just in case I said it on another of the 5,000 shows I do. Um, you know, back in the day, I thought the NDP was what represented my positions. They were the closest. I was a huge mm-hmm. fan of Jack Layton. Um, a lot of what they were saying made sense. Look mm-hmm. at 2024. They're essentially in a co- they're in a, in a like allyship with the neoliberals, who, sorry, like that's where you and I diverge heavily. Because, like, I have always believed that liberals are dangerous. They are more dangerous than conservatives because mm-hmm. they will feign allyship with you. And their sole purpose is to convert revolutionary energy into reactionary energy. Yep. Um, uh, that's like uh, Mel- MLK said. He's like, liberals are nothing but sheep, wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah. So. I think it was, I think the direct quote was that like the conservative is the wolf. You, you see him coming, you know what to expect mm-hmm. from the wolf. He's, he's going to eat you. He's going to mm-hmm. bite you and slash you and, and piss in your hair. That last part wasn't even necessary. I don't know why. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I can't help myself. <clears throat> hey, Nilo. Hey, um, hey dude. But the liberal comes to you as the fox. So it's like, hey, I'm your friend. Da, da, da. These two serve the same master. And it's the mm-hmm. exact same yep. in every Western country. Yeah, It's the controlling the opposition. You control both sides, and then you don't have to worry about in the middle. Especially if you're up here. Because, you know, everybody talks about the World Economic Forum. They're not, they don't just have their hands in one party, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, They have their hands in every party. It's all the way through. And for all the big then of course, here. Then, of course, you got our politicians who get upset because someone said fart in the House of Commons. It's like, how is that what you're concerned about right now? Like, it's no different from, like, the, the, the mean girl stuff that AOC yeah. and MTG get into when they're, like, bickering. Oh it's, all just, it's all just, it, this is all just pro wrestling. It's no different. Mm-hmm. Um, 